This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Israel and the United Arab Emirates have reached an agreement to fully normalize relations after years of secretly working together on countering Iran and other issues. Under the deal, Israel's agreed to temporarily suspend plans to annex the West Bank, a move that appeared to have already been on hold due to international condemnation. The UAE is the first Gulf Arab country to normalize relations with Israel and just the third country in the Arab world to do so after Egypt and Jordan. President Trump announced the UAE-Israel deal on Thursday in an Oval Office event flanked by U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman, his former bankruptcy uh, lawyer, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, and Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. By uniting two of America's closest and most capable partners in the region, something which said could not be done, this deal is a significant step towards building a more peaceful, secure, and prosperous Middle East. Now that the ice has been broken, I expect more Arab and Muslim countries will follow the United Arab Emirates lead. The Palestinian Authority rejected and denounced the trilateral deal and recalled its ambassador to the UAE. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu admitted Israel may still annex the West Bank. There is no change in my plan to apply our sovereignty in Judea and Samaria, in full coordination with the United States. I am committed. It has not changed. I remind you that I am the one who put the issue of sovereignty in Judea and Samaria on the table. This issue continues to remain on the table. Critics of the Israeli occupation decried the deal. Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, the first female Palestinian congresswoman, tweeted, quote, We won't be fooled by another Trump-Netanyahu deal. We won't celebrate Netanyahu for not stealing land he already controls in exchange for a sweetheart business deal. The heart of the issue has never been planned, formal annexation, but ongoing devastating apartheid, she said. Meanwhile, Code Pink's Medea Benjamin warned the deal is aimed at bolstering the, quote, Israel-U.S. Gulf alliance against Iran. We're joined now by Rashid Khalidi, the Edward Said professor of modern Arab studies at Columbia University, author of several books, including his latest The Hundred Years' War on Palestine. Palestine. Professor Halliday, thanks for joining us. Can you respond to this surprise announcement yesterday? Well, uh, in a sense, it's another campaign in the Hundred Years' War on Palestine. Um, this is a great victory for uh, Arab reaction. It's a great victory for the annexationist government in Israel. Um, it's also a, a boost for uh, for President Trump, the Trump regime, which is one of the most authoritarian in American history, um, has now gotten a diplomatic victory. Uh, so I don't see that it has anything to do with peace, of course. Um, the United Arab Emirates was never at war with Israel. Uh, on the contrary, it makes the chance of a, of a just, equitable, and sustainable peace, peace much, much, much harder. So, were you surprised by this announcement? And can you explain how it came about, and then respond to the Palestinian leadership's denunciation and rejection of the deal? Well, it came about partly because of the blowback against um, the Trump-Netanyahu plan to overtly annex territories which, as Rashida Tlaib said, are already under Israeli control. And as Netanyahu said, um, he still plans to annex. Um, but the blowback was so severe that um, both Trump and Netanyahu were forced to recalibrate. Um, and this is something that has already always been ongoing, uh, the plan to bring uh, the most reactionary, most, most absolute monarchies in the world um, into an open uh, public alliance with Israel as part of the Netanyahu-Trump obsession uh, with Iran, um, which is something that these regimes are also obsessed with, given that they, have, they do not depend on consent of the governed, uh, they do not have any kind of domestic legitimacy. They are, they're anti-democratic. They are the forces that fight against democracy throughout the Arab world. Um, the United Arab Emirates is not a force for peace. It's at war with the people of Yemen. It's at war in Libya. Um, it has never uh, been involved in a war with Israel. So this is, this is making overt uh, a relationship that was already covert. Uh, this is making even more uh, salient, uh, an alliance against Iran, uh, which is the wet dream of both Netanyahu and Trump. 
to, to, to dangle Iran in front of people's eyes, to distract them from the kinds of uh, reactionary dictatorships or absolute monarchies. Um, those monarchies uh, uh, are, are so reactionary. Uh, that they make, uh, you know, Henry VIII and Louis XIV look like Tom Paine and Robespierre. They are the most, they are the most absolute monarchies uh, in the world today. Uh, the fact that the United States is supporting them is an absolute disgrace. Well, on Thursday, President Trump was questioned about whether Israel may still annex the West Bank. This is what he said. Prime Minister was, was pretty clear today at his own press conference that he considers this to be a temporary suspension and that the deal would still be open to him at some point in the future. I'm asking what you think he should do. Should well, he right now, all I can say, it's off the table. So I can't talk about sometime into the future. That's a big statement. But right now, it's off the table. Is that a correct statement, Mr. Ambassador? Yes. The word suspend was chosen carefully by all the parties. Suspend, by definition, uh, look it up. That means temporary halt. Uh, it's off the table now, but it's not off the table permanently. So that's the U.S. ambassador to Israel on the sidelines of the press conference, David Friedman, the former bankruptcy lawyer for right. President Trump. Um, Rashid Khalidi, uh, President Trump had said, I wanted it to be called the Donald J. Trump Accord. The National Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien, said President Trump should be the front runner for the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, as I've said, uh, the United Arab Emirates has never been engaged in war with Israel. On the contrary, the United Arab Emirates' uh, air defenses, its missile defenses, are uh, manufactured in Israel and are probably controlled from Israel. So this is a, an ally of Israel in practice. It always has been. Now, we, this has been made public. Um, whatever the president and his ambassador uh, to Israel say, uh, I would I would take Netanyahu at his word. There is no change in his plans. He said it. You, you ran a clip from him speaking in Hebrew. Um, they will continue the ongoing uh, 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 colonization of the, of, the, uh, of the West Bank. They will continue to control it. Absolutely. Israel will continue to be the only sovereign between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. And it will continue... Uh, it's discriminatory policies whereby Israelis have one set of laws and uh, Palestinians under occupation basically have the law of the jungle, i.e. military occupation, military courts in which everybody is always guilty um, and in which uh, about 20 percent of the Palestinian population uh, has, gone, has, has been sent to prison. So we're talking about a jackboot regime which uh, is going to be sustained and continued uh, by this deal. Uh, that's not peace. That's a continuation of colonization and occupation, Brian, whatever the president says. <clears throat> Brian Hook, the State Department's outgoing special envoy for Iran, also spoke at the White House Thursday. Peace between the Arabs and the Israelis is Iran's worst nightmare. And no one has done more to intensify the conflict uh, between the Arabs and Israelis than Iran. And what we see today is a new Middle East. The trend lines are very different today. And we see uh, the future is very much uh, in the Gulf and with Israel, and the past is with the Iranian regime. Meanwhile, Code Pink's Medea Benjamin warned the deal is aimed at bolstering the Israel-U.S. Gulf alliance against Iran, Professor Halley. Right. right. I I'm glad you ran that clip by Brian Hook, because one of the greatest falsehoods that these people peddle is this idea that there is a conflict between the Arabs and Iran. There is a conflict between non-representative anti-democratic regimes in Iran. Arab public opinion considers Israel a great danger. Uh, there are polls every couple of years run by the Arab Center, uh, which show that across a dozen Arab countries, the Arabs, the people, most of them unrepresented by these dictatorships and absolute monarchies, consider Iran a minor threat. It's a, it's a problem, but it's not the number one problem. For these regimes, which have no domestic legitimacy, which do not depend on consent of the government, of course Iran is a problem. Moreover, they need the United States and Israel because they can't defend themselves given the fact and against their people, let alone against external threats, because they have no domestic legitimacy. Um, so this has, uh, I think this is not something between the Arabs and Iran. This is something between unrepresentative and undemocratic Arab regimes. Uh, notably the, the uh, absolute monarchies of the Gulf uh, and Iran. 
Of course, President Trump is feeling somewhat embattled. Former vice president, the presumptive 2020 Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, responded to his Middle East deal, saying in a statement, quote, "...the UAE's offer to publicly recognize the state of Israel is a welcome, brave and badly needed act of statesmanship." And Annexation would be a body blow to the cause of peace, which is why I oppose it now and would oppose it as president. Can you respond to the Democratic position? Well, I think that the leadership of the Democratic Party, uh, from uh, Biden to Senator Harris uh, to the the people who run it, the Schumers and the Pelosi's and the Clintons and the and the Obamas. Uh, all of them are uh, uh, behind the times, uh, the Democratic Party, its base, uh, uh, the people who are going to vote for the Democrats and will hopefully defeat Trump in November and take back the Senate and, and increase the progressive trends in the House, uh, don't feel that way. They, they, they strongly believe that Israel, uh, Israel should uh, be sanctioned uh, for its violations of Palestinian human rights. Uh, they don't have the position. Uh, that, the, that the Democratic Party leadership has. So uh, a lot of work is going to be necessary to force the leadership to do what the people want, that is to say, its own—the it's people who will vote them into office should they win in November. Uh, they don't represent uh, the people that they claim to represent, on this issue at least. And it's going to require a lot of pressure on these people, uh, who are basically mired in the past positions of the Democratic Party, which were always blind to Israel's faults and blind to the Palestinians. Um, this is not this is not new, and it's unfortunately been been uh, uh, in further entrenched uh, by uh, Biden and Harris uh, becoming the, the nominees for the party. Uh, there were several other candidates, uh, obviously Senator Sanders and Senator Warren, but all others who had more nuanced positions, much more in tune with the base of the Democratic Party on this issue, on the issue of Palestine. Uh, so a lot of work is going to be necessary to to to, to uh, uh, force. Uh, a leadership that is, as I've said, completely blind to the, Israel's faults uh, and doesn't see the Palestinians uh, to do the right thing. In the Gaza Strip, um, just as this was being announced, Israeli tanks and warplanes attacked Palestinian neighborhoods overnight for the fourth time this week. Israel said the raids were retaliation for incendiary balloons launched by Hamas, one Israeli missile striking a United Nations elementary school in the crowded al-Shati refugee camp, but failed to explode, prompting an evacuation. This is a 12-year-old student, Leanne al-Musawabi. I was shocked. I went home and told my mother what happened, and I was crying. Why are they hitting the school? Professor Khalidi, do you see a connection between the announcement and what's happening in Gaza now and the significance of that? Well, Israel has been uh, engaged in what one Israeli once called mowing the grass, um, you know, uh, uh, periodically uh, bombarding Gaza. Uh, periodically using overwhelming force uh, against the Palestinians, um, partly uh, in order to uh, 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 keep the Palestinians divided, which is an Israeli objective, uh, to, and to keep Hamas off balance. Uh, Israel and Hamas have been engaged in a secret negotiation for the better part of a year, actually more, um, with the objective of getting a, 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 a real ceasefire in place in return for which Israel would lift some of its incredible restrictions on movement and on uh, the, uh, the, trans the transfer of goods into and out of the Gaza Strip. Uh, and this is, this is part of that tit for tat uh, between, uh, between an, the overwhelming force used by Israel and the relatively minor uh, 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 irritation of uh, balloons that uh, burn some crops. Uh, so Israel will bombard with bombs and missiles. Um, and and uh, what comes from Gaza is is basically a, a, a minor in, in comparison. The importance of it really, I don't think, relates to uh, I don't think relates to this larger deal uh, involving the Emirates. It is it is part of a it is part of a, a policy of divide and rule that Israel has adopted over a very long period of time, and that and that Palestinian division helps. So the Palestinian leaderships in Gaza and the West Bank. That, refu that will refuse to, to put the interests of the Palestinian people ahead of their own narrow self-interest are playing Israel's game, both of them, uh, regrettably, uh, and deserve to be sanctioned by the Palestinian people for their, uh, their blindness.
And you also have uh, both um, President Trump and um, Prime Minister Netanyahu under fierce attack for their how they have dealt with the pandemic. Uh, thousands of Israelis have been in the streets protesting Netanyahu. It has one of the worst outbreaks uh, in the world. Do you see a relationship with what's going on now with this announcement? And also, how would it play out? Um, uh, do you see this happening before the U.S. election? And how do you feel U.S. Um, people in the U.S. would respond to this. Uh, uh, do, do I see annexation happening? Is that is that your question? No. Do you see this deal being um, signed off on? Oh, the Emirates deal. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, this is a feather in this is this Trump sees this as a feather in his cap, uh, as does Netanyahu. Both of them uh, are facing enormous public opposition. Uh, because of their uh, terrible handling of the pandemic, because of their appalling handling of the economic issues, uh, not to speak of issues of racial discrimination and, 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 and police brutality in the United States, not to speak of the Palestine question and the oppression of millions and millions of Palestinians by Israel in the, in the case of Israel. Uh, so they both have enormous uh, pressure on them uh, from the street. Uh, we, we have demonstrations in the street. They have demonstrations in the street in Israel. Uh, both rulers have the kinds of autocratic tendencies. I think they wish they could be Mohammed bin Zayed or, or Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, where they could simply rule by fiat. And the president is moving towards that, trying to move towards that in this country. And Netanyahu has been moving towards that uh, himself. So uh, they are under enormous pressure from below. And this is a distract. This is meant by both of them in terms of domestic public opinion as a distraction. This is from The New York Times, Rashid. Um, Dennis Ross, the former Middle East negotiator for uh, Republican yes. and Democratic administration, said another lure for the Emiratis was the possibility of obtaining advanced weaponry they've long sought, which the United States owes only to countries at peace with Israel to preserve its qualitative military edge in the region. Um, your thoughts? Well, the uh, United Arab Emirates, as I, as I mentioned, already has a anti-missile defense system, uh, which is manufactured by Raytheon, uh, largely, uh, largely from and in Israel. Um, obviously, it's an American company, so they, they've, they've maintained the illusion that they're buying American equipment. I'm sure they would like more of this, uh, but they can already get whatever Israel produces. Now, what they hope to get, I assume, is, uh, is uh, equipment that the United States produces. Um, so it is. It is a cozy. It's a business relationship, um, as Rashida Tlaib, uh, uh, Congressman Tlaib, rightly said. Uh, at base, uh, Bin Zayed is is paying for protection um, from the local bullies on the block, the United States and Israel, uh, from his own people, uh, from the Arab peoples, um, and from external enemies. Uh, and he needs the the, the weaponry. Uh, with which, with which uh, he he can he can defend himself uh, against these external enemies. So yes, I think that is actually part of the deal. Ross unusually is right on this. And finally, what do you think a just deal would look like in the Middle East and between the Israelis and the Palestinians? A just a just deal means equal rights for everybody. A just deal means that uh, uh, national rights uh, have to be uh, accepted for both people. Uh, the nation-state law, uh, Israel is a Jewish nation-state of 2018, said uh, there's only one people entitled to self-determination in the land of Israel. Uh, and that, that, cannot, that cannot stand. Um, there are two peoples there. Uh, any, any, any solution that doesn't accept that and give them equal rights, uh, what, is, what is paraded as a quote-unquote two-state solution, is a one-state solution. One state has sovereignty and control. The other state does not. One state controls movement of everybody in and out. The other state, so-called state, the Palestinian state under a so-called two-state solution would have no control over immigration, import, export, groundwater, airspace. It would not be sovereign. Moreover, uh, Palestinians would be restricted to a tiny fraction of the occupied territories, let alone of, of the entirety of Palestine. This is not. This is not just, and it, it, it can. And the current situation is not sustainable. Uh, so it, there have to be there has to be equality of rights between both people on every level: religious rights personal rights, political rights, and national rights. Rashid Khalidi, we want to thank you so much for being with us. Edward Said, professor of modern Arab studies at Columbia University, author of a number of books, his latest, The Hundred Years' War on Palestine.